it's not as if there is like one unidirectional effect that mobile media have on our social relationships. It is both the good, but also the bad. I am fascinated by the advent of mobile media in our society. Um, if we look back at our history, then we have a very recent history when we particularly look at that technology and how it has invaded our society. It is a young technology, but it has really transformed almost every aspect of our everyday life. And so on the one hand, we have a technology that enables us to like transcend space and time boundaries. So we can now get in touch with the people we like and love 24 seven, wherever we are. Um, and this is a huge benefit. It has enabled us to really strengthen uh, our core network, our strong Thai network. And we do that via intimate communication, but also the very basic communication, like sharing the mundane everyday life by taking a picture of the coffee that you drink in the morning and just sharing that. Um, however trivial that may seem, it is meaningful in the context of a social relationship because you emphasize that the relationship is there and that the other person is worthy of receiving, uh, receiving that picture from you. But on the other hand, and here is the paradox, while it is inherently a very social technology, it is also disruptive because, of course, we use these mobile media not only when we are alone, but also when we are in the presence of other people. And then, of course, the question becomes, if this mobile communication is good for us, well, then the question, I guess, becomes if, if the benefits that we reap in terms of keeping in touch from a distance, if these benefits come with disadvantages for the quality of our face-to-face -face, um, relationships. And this is what we see in our own research where we examined phone use during um, interactions. So for example, if I start using my phone right now during this interview, how this would impact how you perceive me and how I perceive you. When we talk to each other and when we have an intimate conversation, we need to be attentive. And attention works via all of these immediacy behaviors that we um, show. For example, I'm looking in your eyes. Um, my posture is, is open. I'm leaning towards you. But if I take my phone, all of this is hindered. My eyes are towards my screen. I might close my posture a little bit. And you may pick up all of these signals and draw conclusions. Oh, this person is clearly impolite because she is not paying attention to me, whereas this is normative to pay attention. Or I feel social rejected because I'm, I'm used when I'm in an intimate conversation to receive attention. And if this person does not give me attention, well, then clearly that person must not like me. And this becomes ever more clear when the person who is using the phone is actually in a conversation, because then there is a real social exclusion going on. So I'm having a conversation and you are not part of it. And this, I think, is, is also very fascinating because we, we do this. Uh, research shows that in 60% of our conversations, 10-minute conversations, in 60% of those conversations, now at least one person takes out a phone during the conversation. Um, so there are benefits and downsides, and they coexist. It's not as if there is like, one unidirectional effect that mobile media have on our social relationships. It is both the good, but also the bad. So interestingly, most people have a clear understanding that it is not normative to take out your phone during a conversation. But nonetheless, we see that six out of 10 do so during a conversation. So why do we do this? There are multiple reasons that we can think of, but a dominant reason is that the technology is built in such a way that it really automatizes the behavior. So oftentimes we just take out our phone and unlock the screen, not because we have a really conscious intention to consume content, but just because it has been ingrained in our everyday pattern behavior. We just do it all the time and therefore we also do it while we're in a conversation. But the tricky thing is, is if I take it out and I just quickly activate my screen, 
that might be not be so harmful. But if I take it out and I activate the screen and I see that there is a notification, then that of course catches my eye. I'm curious who has been in contact. And then there's this whole um, yeah, decision, um, this tree of decisions that needs to be made. Am I going to unlock my screen? Am I going to read this message? If I've read the message, of course, the blue ticks are activated, so the recipient knows that I've read it. And maybe it's a kind of message that you don't want to leave hanging. So yeah, then I have to engage and actually type a response. And so this tree of decisions can, can lead to behaviors of which we actually know that they are not okay, but we do them nonetheless. But then, of course, our society is also cha changing. So basically our understanding of this behavior as being rude is built upon an understanding of what a conversation, a polite conversation, should look like. But it's not unthinkable that our perceptions of what a conversation should look like are going to change over time. Maybe in five years' time, we will no longer think that it is rude to use a phone during a conversation. Maybe we will just think it is normal. And this is also what we see in our research. If we uh, ask people about their perceptions and their attitudes towards the phone and its presence during conversations, we clearly see that older people um, have much more difficulty with this practice than younger people. They are much more tolerant. And um, based on our research, one of the reasons that young people are more tolerant is just because they, they do it much more often. In, uh, in the field of mobile media research, um, there are several really interesting concepts. Um, and these concepts describe just how much our society has changed. So for example, we have this concept of micro-coordination which refers to arranging the logistics of everyday life in the here and in the now. In former days, when I went home, I would just drive home and if there was a traffic jam, well, then I would be late and then I would basically get home and there would be a fight. Why are you late? I have to go to a meeting, etc. Today it has changed. We can micro-coordinate. So while driving, I can first of all use GPS technology to see if there is maybe a better route that doesn't get me stuck in traffic. But I can also notify my family that I will be late. And while doing that, maybe my family can tell me, hey, can you pass by the bakery because we still lack bread for tomorrow morning. And all of these small uh, aspects of, of the way we coordinate our life um, they fall under the umbrella term of micro-coordination. A second aspect that I really find fascinating is um, we have all of these mobile applications uh, like WhatsApp, Snapchat, uh, all of, basically all of the messengers that we use. Um, and we use them to coordinate activities, but we also use them for a lot of silly, trivial communication just sharing our everyday life like via snapchat you can share the meal that you had in the morning and the picture doesn't stick it self-destructs right so then the question can be why do we do that why do people engage in these kinds of trivial communications there's no point right well there is a point because basically what we see in today's society and the way it is organized, we typically live physically very far from the people we like the most. When you grow older, when you're not in high school anymore, your friends, they tend to spread out. And we lead very, very busy lives. It's difficult to stay in touch with your friends and family when you live far away and, and are always working, attending to your family needs, maybe going to your uh, sports practice. And so these communicative applications, these messengers that allow you to share all of these trivial content, they become very relevant because we may not be together physically, but we have the means to constantly affirm our relationship digitally. The lens through which I look at mobile media um, is a lens in which I differentiate three logics. The first is a network logic. And the network logic refers to the fact that you can today, via mobile media, do activities without having to think about space and time constraints. And this is very nice because it has given us a lot of autonomy. So the benefit of this network logic is autonomy, 
For example, if I want to um, work at home, I can do so. If I want to work uh, in a parking on the way to work, I can do so. I just use my laptop, I use my mobile hotspot. I'm very autonomous in the way I organize my life. But the downside of that is that I'm also responsible. So I constantly have to make decisions. Where am I going to work? When is my work done? When does my private time start? And these decisions have become more complex because mobile media have made it so easy to be on uh, all the time and everywhere. A second logic that I differentiate is the uh, social logic. And again, here is a paradox. So on the one hand, we have this technology, which is so inherently social because it allows us to keep in touch with other people via various different ways, uh, anytime and any place. So it really creates a state in which we are in perpetual contact with other people. But the downside of perpetual contact is that we have to always decide between our online presence and our offline presence. And oftentimes there is a conflict between those two because if I choose to be online all the time, that means that there will be less attention for people in my offline interactions. Because of course, if I'm on my phone, that hinder hinders the attention that I can have for my conversation partner. So again, there um, we have the benefit, but also the downside that you are responsible for deciding when you are going to be on to your friends and family and when you are going to be off to your friends and family. And then the third logic for me is the personal logic. So we have a technology that allows us personalization to a degree that we have never seen before. You can think of your Spotify playlists, your Netflix profile, um, just your phone as a contact list. Everything is highly personal. It is tailored to who you are and the algorithms make sure that you are constantly fed with content that is also relevant to you personally. But the downside of all these algorithms, etc., is that they thrive on, first of all, your information. So you, you have to make public a lot in order to make benefit of the personal side of things. And secondly, again, um, when you are bombarded with content that is tailored to who you are, you constantly have to decide whether you are going to engage or not engage. And for example, if you are uh, watching Netflix, I think all of us can relate to that. Um, Netflix immediately feeds the next episode. And so you have to be mentally strong to resist and say, no, I really have to go to bed now. I have to not binge watch. Um, so you see in these different live domains that there is a trade-off uh, between on the one hand a benefit, we are more autonomous, we can organize our social life more easily, we have access to personalized services, personalized content, etc. But at the other end of the spectrum, we have to decide a lot more and we are personally responsible a lot more. And this, of course, can be situated in, in a broader societal uh, process of individualization where you have on the one hand greater individual autonomy, but on the other hand also um, yeah, the burden of choice.